The Buddha had lots of names for the state of mind, free from passion, aversion, delusion. Nibbana, unbinding, is only one of them. Its meaning is freedom. That's one of the attributes of that state of mind. Another attribute is one of safety. Refuge, harbor, the secure. These are some other names of that same state. And that's what we're looking for as we practice. Something secure inside. As you look at the world around you, and you look inside your own mind, there's a lot of insecurity. There's a lot of change. A lot, of, a lot of things that are unreliable, including your own mind. In fact, that's the most dangerous of all the unreliable things in the world. The mind can be so quick to reverse itself, the Buddha said, that there's no adequate analogy for how quick it is. You can be practicing. And all of a sudden the mind switches direction and says, no, no more, enough. And it can all be very arbitrary. Sometimes it's because the practice is going very well. And you decide, this is good enough. I'll content myself with this. Other times you switch because it's not going well. You put in a lot of effort and you're not satisfied with the results. Instead of looking inside and saying, well, there still must be something wrong inside, you decide there's something wrong with the Dharma. So this quality of the mind that is so unreliable, that's really scary. You can make up your mind you're going to do a lot of good, you want to help the world. But if the mind switches on you, what are you going to do then? We see this with a lot of people who are very corrupt, and yet they seem to have a lot of success in life. You have to assume that they must have made some good karma in the past, but someplace along the line their mind switched. Which is why the practice, straightening out your mind and getting it so that it is reliable, is good not only for you, but also for the world around you. Because if you can't trust yourself, how can anybody else trust you? You've got to make yourself trustworthy, reliable, for sure. So part of that is learning to develop the determination that you're not going to give up and that you've really found something deathless inside, something that doesn't change, something that really is secure, harbor, refuge, unbinding. Because once you've had a taste of that, it really changes everything in the mind. It rearranges the geography inside. What seemed to be just a nice idea suddenly becomes a reality in a very real reality, the sort of thing that can't be forgotten. Now, having a glimpse of that doesn't mean that you're totally there yet, because you also realize there's more work to be done. But from that point on, the Buddha says you're a person who's for sure a niyata person, someone who's certain. Up until that point, you're aniyata, uncertain. And you should use that as a spur to practice. Think of the Buddha's determination that he wouldn't let himself rest content with skillful qualities until they delivered him to some place that really was certain. The other secret to his awakening, which he doesn't mention that much, but it's implicit in the story, 
was his ability to self-correct, observe himself, and to be perfectly honest with himself about what he was doing and the results he was getting. If he wasn't getting the results he wanted, he said, okay, what am I doing wrong? He'd try to find some way around that impasse. And we read about the mistakes he made along the way, but then his ability to stop and take stock. It's one of the things you want to develop as a meditator. And then in your practice as a whole is this ability to step back and observe yourself and learn to provide what you need to keep going. He said, getting in a mood and riding it wherever it's going to go. You have to step back and say, where is this going to take me? And by now we should have enough familiarity with our moods. So they realize, okay, then can't all be rel relied on. And so it's not just stepping back and watching, but it's also learning how to self-correct. To listen to yourself. To ask yourself, okay, where's the mistake in my reasoning here? Where's the mistake in my narrative that I'm telling here? And what can I do to counteract that? That's where you really see discernment, wisdom, and action. It's like learning how to be a tightrope walker. People are good at walking across the tightrope. Occasionally look like they're going to lose their balance, but then they can recover. And it's that ability to recover that makes a difference. You can't expect them to just glide across the tightrope, because after all, they have two legs. They have to put two feet one after the other. They can't just inch, inch, inch along the way. You have to lean a bit to the left, lean a bit to the right to get the feet around. But they also have to know how far they can lean. And if they do lean a little bit too far, how do they get back into alignment? That's the kind of skill you need as a meditator. This is where having that notion of a committee inside is really useful. You have to learn which members of the committee are more reliable than the others. Get them so they're observing one another. Get them to spy on one another. Think of it that way. But it's spying, not just so they can go reporting misbehavior so they can come up with a solution. You know, whoever's in charge of the committee meeting right now, maybe he's, he or she is taking you to the wrong place. Well, how do the other members of the committee get together and say, well, we've got to change course? Learn how to have some rules of order in your internal conversation. Learn how to have balancing factions. So even though the mind may still be uncertain, it hasn't reached that point of certainty. It can self-correct. This is why we use our powers of judgment. Not to put a final stamp of yes or no on ourselves, but to watch the work that we're doing. Catch mistakes before they amplify. And if you begin to see the mind beginning to turn around and leave the practice, well, find some way of turning it back. Because this is a difficult pr practice we've got. If it were easy, everybody would, would have glided to Nibbana a long time ago. But the thing is, the Buddha saw when people are born after having passed away. 
is it's like a stick being thrown up in the air. Sometimes it lands on this end, sometimes it lands on that end, sometimes it lands splat in the middle. And even though it is determined by your actions, your actions are tend to be all over the place. So whatever intention comes barging through at the moment of death, and whatever opportunities it has to choose from, can look pretty random or outside, because there is that quality. We have the ability to observe ourselves, which is why we have the ability to do things in the present moment that shape our present moment experience, that principle of causality, in which some of the things we're experiencing right now come from the past, but some come from the present. That's our potential rescuer. But all too often it's it's a wild card. You suddenly get it in your head to go one direction and then suddenly again go in another direction. And that's what freedom has as its toll. The ability to make huge mistakes. If we didn't have freedom of choice, if everything were predetermined, okay, we'd all be following the machine as it took us to awakening. But that's not how the causality works. We've got influences coming in from the past. We've got this potential for freedom here in the present moment to choose. And so much of the practice is learning how to choose wisely and realizing that just because there is a tendency in the mind at some point that seems to be leading you off the path. Just because the tendency is going in that direction doesn't mean that you, you're committed to it. We have this strange set of values that something unskillful comes in, and we fall under its power, and then we feel that we're committed to it. We have to see it all the way through. Whereas the path is something you say, well, I'll, maybe. We don't feel quite so committed. You have to ask yourself, what's wrong with your mind that it feels committed to unskillful things, when it can't commit to what's really skillful? Part of it's because what's unskillful is a lot easier. So at least it's easier in the doing. It's going to entail a lot of trouble down the line. So one of the voices that you've got to listen to is, the one that asks, what are the consequences going to be? Where is this going to lead? And a lot of times you know it's going to lead down. And still you go with it. You have to ask, why? What's in the mind? What's gotten into you? So again, think of the committee. You've got lots of different voices in there. Look for the wise ones. Look for the ones that are concerned about long-term consequences. And understand that the most dangerous thing in the world is your own mind. And the dangerous thing that you're responsible for is your own mind. And it's not the case that you're the only one that will suffer if the mind changes direction. Other people will suffer too. But if you can straighten out your own mind, other people will benefit. This is not a selfish practice. It focuses on what you're doing. It focuses on your happiness, but with the realization that there's a ripple effect. Each of us is a causal node, you might say, making decisions freely in the present moment that send out ripples and feeling the ripples of other people's decisions. But we can't get into other people and make their choices for them. Each person has to be responsible for his or her own choices. So keep your hands firmly in the controls and try to take advantage of the fact that you do have this freedom of choice in the present moment. 
try to use it wisely. Because if you're wise in how you use it, it can lead you to a state of security. Now you don't know that until you got there. But at least it's a possibility. And we live in this world where there are so many other things that deny that possibility. We have to actively resist their influence. And respect our desire for a genuine refuge. And the sense of responsibility inside this is You don't want to abandon the path now that you've found it. You want to see it all the way through. 